All right, we can kick it off. Thank you everybody for joining. You're all joining from various different parts of the world and time zones. So appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, this is our March meeting and the agenda for today is uh, three big topics. The first one is <clears throat> previewing BigQuery data sets in Amundsen by Jacob Muller at Unity. The second one is usage of Amundsen at Databricks by Tao, who is a maintainer on Amundsen and works at Databricks. And the third one is some update on roadmaps uh, and we will specifically talk about an update from Lineage, from Allison, uh, and an update on GCP proxy uh, from Marius. And we'll leave five minutes at the end for any questions you may have. Um, as we go through presentations, feel free to raise your hand during that time uh, on Zoom. And then once the presentation is over, I'll queue you up to ask your question. So thank you again for joining. I'm gonna pass it on to Jacob to talk about previewing data sets in Amundsen. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Jacob from Unity. I just uh, started in January, actually. So pretty new. I hope you're seeing my presentation with previewing BigQuery now, right? Yeah. I have, I have two screens, so I'm a little, all right, perfect. Yeah, just started and uh, we had started, Unity had started working on Amundsen a month or two before I started. And then I've been picking up a lot of work on it and been trying to, to keep our, our patching of the repo to a minimum by contributing back as much as possible. Um, and yeah, one of the first bigger things was previewing BigQuery data. And the way I started out doing that was, uh, I'm just gonna tell a little bit about the process and then we'll look a little bit at how it looks in the UI and how the code looks like. Uh, so I started by thinking, what do I know about BigQuery? I know I'll need to get all the data from some table. I'll want to use select star because I don't really have an option. I need all the data from the table. Uh, I knew in the back of my mind that select star wasn't a great option uh, due to cost concerns, um, but I, I didn't really know what to do about it. So I figured it was time to to read the manual and uh, if there's any Game of Thrones fans, uh, I found this <laughs> lovely quote from Sam, Sam Tower and I should, I should probably had uh, have started uh, started where he started and uh, read the manual and, and followed the instructions because uh, as soon as I did, Google had this, uh, this nice little tip on uh, select star from BigQuery. Um, so they quite, quite quickly told me, don't do what you're trying to do. And then I thought, okay, then what do you do instead? Uh, and looked a little bit around the UI. In the UI, they do have a preview button and I figured that that sounds, uh, sounds useful for what, what I'm trying to achieve inside of Amundsen. Oh, right around the, yeah, a little bit more on the, the most expensive. Uh, so looked a little bit around for the preview option and the next part of the, the manual was very nice to see that you can actually do previewing for free. So if you're experimenting with or exploring your data, you can use table preview options to view your data for free and without affecting quotas. So very nice. Thank you to Google for, for giving me that option. Um, looked at what they suggested, looked at the preview inside of, uh, of the UI. Again, it's, it also seemed a lot faster than actually querying. So that was also very nice. Um, and then in the end, what they did suggest was use the list rows API or table list, which we'll get to in a second when we look at the code. First, I'm just gonna a quick peek at what it looks like in the UI for anyone who hasn't worked with the preview button, it would work the same for all of them. Uh, and please uh, just imagine that it was this was a big query data set. I've just set it up on my local host with the sample data loader to, to not accidentally show something I wasn't supposed to show from our own Amundsen. Uh, and here's what it looks like when it's, it's all hooked up. And then Let's see if I can find the code. 
out of source. So the actual code consists uh, based on, on some of the other client base, consists of a, a base class, which implements the, the actual get preview data function and a helper function for, for taking BigQuery schema fields and turning them into Amazon column items. And then a, a list rows function that needs to be implemented by you the, or the user, uh, which there is an example implementation of that I have right now hardwired to just look at some public data set. Uh, but we can remove that. And then it would be gets in the project ID, the table name and the, and the project name from, from its caller uses the list rows APIs, which makes it free. It takes a preview limit that you can configure in your initialization of the parent class. Then it runs through the schema, turns all of the fields into to column items, and then it packs the data into preview data friendly format and returns it so get preview data can, can show it in the UI. And make sure that if there are any keys that have no data at all, they are, they are thrown away from the column items. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Other than that, the rest of previewing data with BigQuery works as it's documented in Amazon and works the way it, it otherwise works. Uh, so, fairly small client based on on some of the other clients but pretty nice to have for for bigquery oh i guess one thing we could add from the base client is um you can this it takes a list of previewable projects this was uh, needed in our use case uh, might update it with taking in labels in the future uh, I think it was a uh, like first our first try kind of POC version took a list of projects that it's allowed to show data from. But down the road, we would like to to utilize labels to make sure that we don't show PII data in in preview. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's kind of what I had. Cool. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Madison had a question. Madison? Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, you talked a bit about the select star versus uh, sort of previewing the data. Can you talk a bit more about how you got around doing a select star for this particular approach? Yep, sure. Uh, so Google offers this, it's called list rows in, in Python. Um, they I think it's called table list underscore data on the actual API documentation. I can uh, I can send a link in the chat to to the part of the documentation where it's where they write about it uh, when I'm I'm done here. So this just it doesn't really give you any select or any control over what it shows. It'll just give you a paginated response of of the max results that you define to it. And then it'll just give you all the data and it responds pretty much instantly. I think usually when querying big query would select star or select anything, it, it has like a two, three second just time of being big query to select anything. Uh, whereas this one seems almost instant for, for at least for small max result limits. You're on mute, Rob. Uh, ah, I finally unmuted my video. Um, hi, yeah, I had a question. Uh, Rob here from King. Um, 
You mentioned PII data here. Um, how, are you, how are you accessing that data in BigQuery and were there any kind of further security considerations that you had to had to go through to be able to enable this in terms of providing access to the to the to, to the preview through Munson? Um, I, we're, we're running uh, Amundsen in, in Kubernetes, so we already had a service account that was set up with with the BigQuery access that it needed. So it was... Uh, okay, so, so you just essentially gave that the Amundsen service account access to read all of that data that you surface. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah because it, it, it reuses the same uh, one that we use for Data Builder, the same service account that we use for Data Builder which has access to all the data that we put in Amundsen for good reason, of course. Um, Robert, I'm yeah, sorry about co co column, column per columns or, or what was the question here? Are you concerned about PII data cut per, for a certain column or was it more like access to, to BigQuery? Uh, it, yeah, it was more sort of PII data per columns. I, I, I just wondered how granular your your access levels were across different types of data uh, set and whether or not you had, had anything. I, I kind of presumed that there probably was just one service account, but I wondered whether perhaps there was a, a, a more oh. complex implementation behind the scenes there or not. All right, yeah, not at, not at the moment. Right now, it's just the list of previewable projects are Google projects where our BigQuery does not for sure have PII data, so we can show everything. Uh, and down the line, we'll, we'll need to be looking at column labels and labels. Uh, but I think first step on, in that direction will be to allow the client to take uh, like labels or have a, a label that is always safe and then only have it on, on totally safe data sets and tables. And then hopefully down the line, we can also get some column label integration working. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll be sure to to push it back when we start working on it. Cool. Seems like that was the last of all questions. Thank you uh, for taking the time, Jacob, to show this to us. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, I just need to find the stop share button. One second. Cool. Uh, next up is Tao. Tao is going to talk about uh, usage of Amundsen within Databricks. Cool. Uh, give me one second. Let me find the screen. <laughs> so could, uh, could you see my screen? Yep. Give me one second. Hi everyone, so uh, today I'm going to talk about how to use uh, Amazon to improve the discovery at Databricks. So for those who don't know me, so I previously worked at, at Lyft. I was uh, working with uh, Amazon at the beginning, so I was a tech lead there. So right now I'm moving to Databricks to uh, do a few initiatives, uh, in, including like improving discovery, their discovery. So let me present the slide actually. So for those who don't know Databricks, it is it's a, it's a unified data and AI platforms. So from the left-hand side, it's a, you can see there's a, uh, many different uh, open format like structured, unstructured, semi-structured formats. And you, you have a data, uh, delta layer sit on top and then there are many different applications like including SQL analytics, data science, ML workflows on top to provide power the data and AI. Uh, user experience. For this, uh, for using Amazon right now, you're just having like uh, support like table, data set, and dashboard and user. So for now, we are just uh, mostly leveraging what open source is offering. Like for table or data set, we are using like the Delta lay, uh, extractor to extract the metadata around Delta. For dashboard, we are, we are using like SQL analytics or Redash. A Redash is also an open source um, BI analytics tools similar to like MetaBase or Superset. Uh, 
For those, we also using like the community contributed redash dashboard extractor. Uh, let me talk a bit about like uh, the deployments at Databricks. So everything is uh, in the VPN. And at Databricks, like we have uh, two, two uh, our architecture is mostly uh, in different uh, data center is uh, have a control plane concept and a data plane concept. They are different VPC, uh, they are different uh, uh, subnet, they, they could be different account. All the services, uh, for Amazon are deployed in, in the control plane and everything are on Kubernetes. So you could see like uh, what, we, what we did at Databricks is like we, we took, we also using the same approach what, I, what we did at Lyft back then is like we have a get some modules and then we have a bunch of private uh, files either configs or extend API, et cetera. See on top and we bake the Docker image on top. So basically our overlay on private on top of the open source. And we, we build different image, uh, have the pod and for front end search and metadata, they are mostly uh, stateless services. So you could basically put any numbers of pods and resource you want based on the load. And for um, Elasticsearch side, right now we are just using the AWS managed Elasticsearch, but uh, we also have a way to build a, a Elasticsearch cluster using the open distro. From the, uh, we are still using Neo4j, like we mostly also like uh, build a Neo4j port with a high memory usage. To ingest the metadata, so those are on the data plane side. So uh, at Databricks, we don't use Airflow or we mostly don't use, I would say. And all the data builder or metadata ingestions are put in notebooks, uh, Databricks notebook. For actually, that, that actually is pretty quite um, convenient because uh, you could collect, uh, no, in notebooks, you could collaborate. You could interactive execute and see the result play around, see whether you return or not return and what kind of format you have. After you are satisfying like the in, uh, metadata or data builders, you could convert it, the notebook into a job services to um, uh, load back the metadata back to the control plane. If you will see that it cross two different planes. So in that case, we need to like wireless the, uh, the, uh, the nap. The job top typically run on a cluster Cluster is a concept in Databricks that you could load different, uh, it has a bunch of uh, worker nodes you could define and you could load bunch, uh, install any uh, library, like could be Java, uh, Java or Python or something else. Uh, we wireless the uh, network so that like the Databricks jobs uh, could load the data back to the Neo4j and Elasticsearch. And in that case, we don't necessarily need to depend on airflow for the ETL orchestrations. Okay, so let me do a bit of demo uh, with some screenshots on what, what it looks like and talk about the few things we have changed. So first the popular table. So uh, we, we found that the default like is uh, showing only four popular table is pretty limited so based on the uh, uh, some of the uh, internal user feedback. So in, increased to 10. Also a heuristic actually is changed and very different from uh, uh, what it has in the, in the open source. The open source one is favorite like, uh, also to be a long time ago. So uh, when we initially built the popular table, we favor the total counts, total, total usage, like basically, uh, but for us, we are more like, in, uh, want to show like the distinct user as well as uh, the number of dashboard that attach the given uh, table. So we change our heuristic internally to favor those. So we don't really care like the total recounts and we, we uh, care more about what the distinct users so or number of dashboards. And then we also sort by the uh, doing some uh, sorting to surface the most relevant uh, table based on this heuristic. Second is uh, uh, our table formats. So uh, here is a typical Delta tables we have uh, in, uh, in productions, like for 
our uh, uh, work from typically have bronze, uh, silver, gold. So we mostly care about the gold, gold table. Like if for those who don't know, like bronze is normally the raw formats and then you do some data transformation, create silver table, and then you up, uh, after doing some data cleansing, you have the gold table. That would, uh, for, let me illustrate a bit of this. It's like it's a delta tables. The description wise, uh, we disable the descriptions editing, and we always refresh the uh, source so that um, so that it's, uh, it doesn't diverge that much. It's uh, it's a bit different from what we did at uh, uh, what I did at Lyft. It's just like we we still support manual editing, and because like at Databricks. Uh, it's same as live is that we have a wiki to organize and there's already pretty good descriptions. Uh, we have a wiki, uh, a build an internal wiki extractor that, uh, to extract those uh, description to, uh, though the wiki only have a few tables and we extract the descriptions and paste it into the uh, part. Have a few tags, also cons uh, consume the usage owners and what, uh, a, a few differences. We we surface the lineage. So so to to extract the data uh, lineage, especially like tables, uh, uh, we don't talk about the uh, column here. To extract the lineage, there are two typical ways. One is a runtime. So uh, runtime means like you can compute the. You have some framework like data flows. Like in Airflow, you could actually provide like input output data sets or using uh, any other uh, other frameworks that you could uh, provide the input and output lineage in, uh, during the computation or in the comp uh, in afterwards, like basically based on usage log. And for here, like we are mostly leveraged the latter part. It's like we, can, uh, we, we get like, for example, we know like which job consume what tables that is considered upstream table. And we also knowing for this job, what are the table it has been generated. For that, we could actually, and this job we know like actually is generated a uh, given data set. For that, we actually could compute uh, the downstream, downstream lineage as well upstream lineage. We also service like what the downstream job depends on this table. All of this are actually, that will should be a native UI built by uh, the team at Lyft, like Alison, Daniel and Marcos. And, but for now, we are just leveraging the existing feature, the service, like the programmatic descriptions, and to service a few tape uh, uh, in the tape tablet formats. Lastly, for Delta is uh, MVCC, so there's a bit different versions. And at uh, DataBricks, like we, we uh, especially a data team, like we collaborate very closely with the data team, is like uh, build a view uh, on top of many tables. Oftentimes, it's hard to tell, like, What's the DDL of these views? We also serve a bunch of like the extended metadata uh, for this view. And uh, yeah, so from the net, uh, navigation part, typically, uh, uh, I think this community using Airflow to to run and generate the table. But we serve, we using like uh, we actually view RAM and using like the surface like which notebooks and jobs generate these given tables. So we also service the link there and also the job link. Lastly, is so we're using the data tab. For those who don't know, like uh, in a Databricks workspace, uh, you also have a data tab, which you connect to a cluster and surface like some sample data. We, we uh, connect the data tab back uh, the, in the page back to a data tab so that you can see a sample profile. And we don't leverage the preview button here. The explore uh, here, explore button here is a uh, go to SQL analytics redash, allow you to run some SQL. Yeah, so uh, these are more detail. Uh, uh, talk about some of the customizations, like we surface lineage information, like disabled description editing, uh, anything. And surface extend metadata, like table versions, view DDLs, and lastly, it's like uh, the the application models like to to surface the relationship between uh, ETL job and the table. Uh, per se is a bit tied to Airflow. We change a bit, and then 
use it for servicing uh, notebook jobs and, and tables so that we don't need to have a dependency on F. Uh, a few fix, uh, mostly not done by me, but, uh, but done by the, uh, my team. So fix a few issue with Redux Extractor because it doesn't work for the latest versions. Uh, there's a box like since the beginning inside the tag search, Elasticsearch index is not refreshing real times. That has been fixed as well. And lastly, it's like, because everything is on Spark, we also build a Spark extractor to allow build any um, model based on certain Spark SQL. Yeah, so to, to summarize, it's like, uh, that's, uh, that's what we use right now yeah, for data, uh, Adabricks to for data discovery. Uh, still pretty early to, we right now we are just like getting, uh, gathering some uh, initial feedback. Uh, and yeah, that's uh my last slide. Any questions? Not sure anyone else here are using data brick. Are uh, in, uh, in data brick store? Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Tao. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. I've got one from Nirav, uh, and he's asking: surfacing lineage information is preloaded similarly to programmatic description or is it generated uh, dynamically? Preloading. Got it. And I, how do you how do you get this lineage information, Tav? Uh, so it's uh, the lot, the heuristic is uh, is uh, very internal. So it's uh, mostly tied to, tied to, uh, it's, 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 uh, all like, like usage, you could consider like you parsing the SQL, but we don't do that. But we have a way to like extract the the, the query plan and figure out the, the the upstream downstream. But the hardcore part definitely is done by the the the, uh, uh, the sister team or data team. But to summarize, it's most it's same as like what uh, some of the other companies did like SQL parsing also. But yeah. It's all done by using uh, based on usage rule. Makes sense. Uh, there are a few questions here. I'm gonna see if Nikhil wants to unmute and ask the question. Hey, Mark. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Tao, for uh, uh, for the presentation. So this is Nikhil from DoorDash. Uh, so my question was uh, around the notebooks that you use uh, to extract metadata. So uh, are there any plans to open source these notebooks? Uh... Oh, the notebook is nothing uh, really uh, open source. We just like, everything is, uh, we are using the data builder. So mm -hmm. if you're familiar, we have a data builder packages where basically arbitrary, like you could uh, connect with any source and publish it to any sync. Uh, mm -hmm. We just like I live. We are like building a ETL FO DAG to leverage that library. But just like at Databricks, we are just like put the same set of code into notebook, so mm -hmm. that we could play it interactively. But the notebook itself is nothing. Uh, it's just like based on uh, using the Databricks environment. Yeah. I see. So there is a uh, integration directly from uh, if, if we want to directly uh, copy this data from the data builder to the notebook. Uh, there is uh, integration between uh, uh, we, we can publish this particular data metadata directly to Amundsen. Uh, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned in the deployments, so inside the notebooks, normally you are uh, not sure you are on their bricks or not. So typically what the data bricks notebook does is that you connect to a cluster. That cluster actually install all the prerequisites dependency. In our case, then we store the data builder dependency like with we pick the PyP, not typically the latest one. And then you could just like put the put the library dependency as well as the metadata injection code into the notebooks. Mm -hmm. And then once we satisfy some of this and found that it's correct, correctly could be published to the to the amongst uh, Neo4j's, then we convert the notebook into a job, like ETL job to, to run it uh, regularly. Like, like it's same as same concept as uh, using an airflow to schedule your uh, deck. Yeah. I see, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, another small question. So will uh, Amundsen be a separate offering or will it be bundled with uh, other database products? Uh, I'm not sure if it is planned yet. 
Oh, that's uh, TBD for now, I would say. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Ma. Well, I see a question from Ben Coppersmith. Yeah, mine, mine's just about the custom SQL extractor. So we use Databricks uh, and, and Amundsen, and we stuff some custom tags into the Hive Metastore. So uh, can you talk more about that extractor and what it does? Um, I need to go back to look at, I think it's some of the last updated, either last updated time or, or partition timestamp or something. But basically it's like, if you want to run, um, the concept is that you could create your own Spark SQL, and then you, the re result, you could have a data frame from the Spark SQL, and then you pipe it into a, uh, have some custom uh, transformation pipe it into the uh, data builder model. And we found that actually there's a, uh, having a Spark SQL extractor will be convenient in that case. I, I, I think I have an initial PR, but never just like add the test. I need to still finish that PR though, yeah. Cool, thanks. Cool, Allison. I guess I was just asking about um, like Spark SQL, were you using it to extract any sort of like, do you surface any information about like the jobs themselves right now? Like status. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you see, um, uh, we are also surfacing like for a given data set, what are the job are using this? So if you can see the, uh, from a lineage perspective, it's like there's a given job, like read a bunch of upstream tables, and then you will produce to a, a bunch of downstream table. So in that case, we also service, like say all the downstream job that depending on this data set. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Makes sense. Tao, I have a question and this was around descriptions. So you mentioned that the descriptions were disabled in the UI uh, and you get them from the underlying Delta Lake. Um, did you consider sending the descriptions from the UI to Delta Lake? And uh, what were your thoughts there? Uh, so that's the same what we did at Lyft initially, right? It's like, uh, initially we want to sync back to the high meta store, yep. but we found we found that actually uh, because like currently that uh, Monson doesn't have a good fine green ACL, and description is the only uh, mostly the one that is uh, still require manual editing and could be diverge, so that we don't we just disable that and then using the underneath one so that you could you doesn't need diverge to push push back to delta i don't think it's a good idea because like there's could be many different connectors it's pretty cumbersome so at that time our call to publish back to high meta store is extra extra complexity and we just end up just delete those power and we don't we don't think it's a we don't spend time on publish back to delta the same as well Makes sense, thank you. Any other questions for Tao? Yes, I have one. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, uh, great seeing this uh, Tao. Um, so two questions. Uh, one is was halfway answered, I guess. I was curious if this is, you mentioned you had a uh, an internal data team. So is, if this is, for use internally at uh, Databricks or, or something yes. new? Currently, that... it's just mostly just for uh, within Databricks is uh, internal for, for like, um, there are many different like not uh, solution architects, custom success engineers, like even PMs, engineers, that's mostly targeting, yeah, for now. Yeah. Every, every company has data. Yeah, but if Databricks uh, is a, uh, different I would say so yeah. you have yeah. the data everyone is data team I would say but there's one team is mostly for the internal data yeah, yeah. that's what we call data yeah, okay got it so the other question is um, so you basically opted out of of uh, using a, a data builder and uh, I don't know if it's if uh, what you build on on the uh, on the data plane is is uh, essentially a fork or it's a different implementation in, in Java or something. Uh, um, 
it's same as data builder. We're still using data builder. It's just okay. like, we just like, uh, 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 for example, I live, we are just have a ETL repos putting bunch of DAGs and then the DAGs is cons uh, include the, the data builder code. Yeah, okay. uh, and then we build a bunch of effort tasks to, so that we could schedule. But we just uh, at at, the, uh, at Databricks, we 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 move the that construction code and task construction code, and then we put the uh, just the data builder logic into the notebook. And uh, in that case, we could interactively uh, schedule different uh, notebook cell uh, to get the data, and then um, and then once we satisfy and see it is correct, then we convert it into a jobs uh, ETL jobs, and and. Databricks is like most of the source of truth for table right now is still stored in a high meta store, but that high meta store is in control plane is are not easily accessible for those are in a Databricks customer. They know like in control plane is uh, most of services not very uh, accessible from the data plane. So, so we're using Delta extractor in that case to get the Delta information. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I guess my, my concern with uh, your ingestion code and and uh, and uh, when data builder evolves, uh, that it would uh, how you would manage it, uh, not drifting apart, um, that falls away then because you're still building on on data builder. Oh uh, yeah, it, uh, it doesn't drift away. It's just like leveraging the open source one. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Tao. If you all have any other questions, feel free to hit them up on the channel. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to move on to updates on the roadmap. The first one is on lineage from Allison. Uh, thank you, Mark. Let me, I'm going to send the, um, so basically we opened up an RFC for our first iteration of how we want to implement lineage and Munson. In particular, uh, I'm going to walk through a little bit of the UI that we've come up with for this first iteration. So I'm going to send the, I just sent the link to the PR with the RFC. And now I'm going to share my screen to share. I always forget how to share a screen. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. Can you see the markdown? Yep. Oh. So yeah, basically for this iteration of lineage, we wanted to do something that was a little smaller in increment than the full graph view of lineage that we had. Uh, showcased in a previous meeting. Um, and so we basically narrowed it down to showing like a table view of lineage for this first iteration. And so as you can see, this, this graph is, has to change a little bit based on some feedback uh, we got on this RFC. But basically this work is going to focus on metadata service and then on front end. Uh, on metadata, we're going to be uh, you probably noticed already on master, on Neo4j proxy, we've added a get lineage method that has no implementation right now. And it's added to the base proxy as well. So for any um, proxy that like for any, yeah, for any data source or any connection that you use um, for your implementation of a Munson, you're gonna have a get lineage method that you can implement however you see fit. And then the table lineage API and the column lineage API are going to call on that method and return the results uh, in the structure of a lineage and lineage item schema. So those are already out of months in common and you can take a look at those. Um, and basically what this is going to do is it's going to allow people to implement uh, lineage based on however they get their lineage data. Because right now we don't have a plan to support like open lineage or anything like that, uh, but might be something worth doing in the future. And we're just focusing on metadata rather than going ahead and doing uh, an extractor, transformer and loader on data builder um, as part of the first iteration, because on Lyft internally, we're just calling some ad hoc, like some service ad hoc that will give us lineage information, but we are planning on preloading 
like pre-computing in the future, uh, have that on Neo4j and then query Neo4j directly for this data. So this is an evolving plan, but this is the first uh, plan that we came up with. On the front end here, you can see two screenshots. The first one is showing uh, table lineage. And so what we're planning to do is on the uh, table details or resource details page, we'll show you obviously the normal column dashboards and then we add an upstream and downstream tab that shows you upstream lineage and downstream lineage. Uh, this pattern kind of follows the similar pattern to dashboard. So you could think of dashboard to table as some as a form of lineage. And so upstream tables and downstream tables is just an extension of that in a sense. Um, and here we would show you the data set name, uh, how uh, far up or down it is from the current table, the source, so where it came from, Hive, whatever, like BigQuery, whatever other data sources you might have, uh, and any badges associated with it. So that way you can quickly say, okay, if you have a deprecated badge, you could say, oh, the table upstream of this was deprecated, so we should probably move to use something else. Or you could have a PII badge and be like, oh, there's private information that's coming from our upstream or going into our downstream that we should be careful in managing. So it gives you a lot of like handy tidbits of data. Um, and then for columns, uh, we are doing something that looks similar to what Tao was showing for table lineage in uh, Databricks, which is have uh, two little sections of upstream columns and downstream columns. And we're gonna condense it to the first, I believe like five, and then uh, you would have see all option because we've noticed that at least at Lyft, we have some columns that have like a thousand downstream columns uh, indirectly. And then directly it will have like in the number of like hundreds. So yeah, that's basically what we're trying to have the first iteration of this implementation look like. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. Here you can kind of see what we expect the API responses to look like. Uh, and then, oh, weird, I didn't add the options. Well, yeah, but through the response, you can kind of see what the idea is. We would get the key uh, direction that was requested. So you can request for either upstream or downstream, uh, upstream entities and downstream entities. And then the entities themselves would have the key for the source, uh, the key for the resource, the level, so how far they are. Uh, the source, any badges associated, and then we added like an, like a metric that we can sort these results by. In our case, would be usage, right? So like, how many, how how frequently is a table used, and that would determine. Okay, we want to show this um, table uh, higher up than a table that is not used as often in our lineage too, in our lineage view. Um, so yeah, that's basically it, and that's what we're planning and moving forward with. If you want to add your thoughts and comments to the RFC, please feel free to do so. I sent the link in the chat. Cool, thanks. Nirav, you want to ask your question? Um, yeah. Um, so um, um, basically, uh, you know, like uh, uh, at at uh, at Experian, uh, we we do have a. Uh, lineage uh, is is uh, is a one use case where we want to see the upstream and downstream, but uh, uh, I think uh, the the uh, another uh, um, uh, requirement is to to get it out. Uh, what are the uh, what are the information are at a similar level because uh, at a, at a different geographical location, uh, the same details could be interpreted into the into uh, into the with with a different uh, description. Uh, so let's take an example of, uh, let's say in USA, uh, there is SN, but uh, the same thing could be called out uh, in Europe, could be done differently. Uh, in, in India, it, it is maybe a PAN card uh, or, or in the, probably in the South America, it could be different. So we want to have the, we want to see the uh, same level of information. So would we include those kind of information as well into this RFC? Um. I'm not entirely sure what you mean. Um, does anyone have like? Yeah, hey Nirav, this is this is table lineage. I think you were talking about like business term lineage or uh, metric lineage. Like that is not the scope of this work right now. No, so so what, what I'm talking about, let's say uh, the the same table, right? Like means uh, is, is holding it out. Uh, so uh, uh, so let's say this is a 
probably uh, test table one. Uh, in a, in a, in a one one a group, they are calling it out uh, test table one, but and holding it out consider the customer data. But the same uh, uh, same kind of customer data, but in different group, they are they have also their own implementation, and they call out uh, uh, with a different table. And uh, uh, if you want to implement uh, the same data science model, uh, we want to know that okay, uh, what what is the equivalent name into the probably a different region? Yeah, that makes sense. I don't, I don't think this captures it. It's almost like a logical grouping of table and their physical mapping based on the region you operate in. Mm -hmm. That would be a good layer to add in the future, but not, I don't think that's the goal for this master. Yeah. So, so, so over here, we are, we are talking about uh, uh, the kind of uh, a parent-child relationship uh, and uh, uh, it's kind of, you know, like a horizontal expansion where we are talking about the siblings as well. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so how do you distinguish, uh, how do you distinguish this, the same table in different regions? Are they a one page or two page? Uh, are they a one table or different table in Amazon? Uh, so they are a different table uh, uh, and uh, it's a different schema. Uh, so, I mean, so, okay, so uh, let's say, uh, if 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 uh, means we 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 uh, so we, we have the some of the uh, 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 group which are the maybe like Spanish speaking so the name of the table is is probably into the Spanish um, and uh, in in the probably uh, you know like means in in, uh, in the USA those are the, probably into the different name but uh, essentially they are holding it out as similar information. I see. So those tables would be equivalent, but they, I, I don't think that this, that rather fits into the lineage concept. I think that would be more like a, associated tables, like a table group, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So it means uh, we, we have a kind of uh, associated tables as well as the associated column as well. That could be something that you can surface through like programmatic descriptions if you wanted to, right? You could leverage programmatic descriptions and add a section on the table details portion that says, okay, these tables are the similar. If you have that like logical grouping already in your data, you can say these tables are associated with this particular table, but they're for different regions. Um, but I don't know if that would fit into the use case of lineage that we're trying to uh, implement that shows you where did the data in your current table come from uh, upstream or downstream? Okay, yeah. And, 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 and the second question is, uh, so um, as, as you have added the uh, badges, uh, so is there any plan to add out a description as well? Uh, uh, so just, just like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, if I, I mean, when we, when, uh, when, when we, when we have the kind of gra graphical view, and if you click on that relationship, it will also pop up some kind of description saying that, okay, uh, these, these, uh, this downstream table is getting loaded from the upstream on this frequency or, or kind of, you know, a small description to, mm -hmm. to put it out a kind of message that, okay, how this relationship is, is being built out. That can certainly be, be done. Uh, we didn't plan it for this iteration, but these data set names are all clickable. So like, it would lead you to the table details page where you could see a description. Uh, but that, that is something that is worth suggesting as well, if you want to put in the RFC or whatever, like we could easily have a, a description similar to how we do um, in like, when you see the list of uh, search results, like that that is something that can be done. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Cool, any other questions for Allison? All right, that will be it. Thank you, Allison. Appreciate you sharing this. Great, thank you, Mark. And um, then next step is one more roadmap update, this time from uh, Marius about uh, GCP proxy. Sure, can I hear you well? Yep. All right, so I'm sharing my screen. Uh, this is a very brief update really, because uh, this is more like a uh, idea I put out in the open. So last year we in the IMG had some 
um, proof of concept using Amundsen in the cloud and uh, actually moving our data platform to the cloud. And the result of this um, POC was that we came up with the idea to use uh, GCP data catalog as a proxy for Amundsen for anyone who doesn't know the, uh, the GCP and the data catalog service is uh, totally uh, managed by Google, uh, a kind of uh, metadata store for all the um, entities that are um, being produced in uh, the Google Cloud uh, environment as a part of like big data processing. So big query tables are available in um, data catalog and stuff like that. And we wanted to try the idea of um, using Amundsen directly with data catalog. So it would be a co completely managed uh, uh, proxy for Amundsen. It doesn't require deploying any kind of resources. And basically this RFC just like surfacing this idea. Um, I have just a very brief presentation of what data catalog looked like and why we didn't consider it to be a good idea and wanted to replace it with Amundsen. So the UI of data catalog is basically, uh, as you see, uh, nothing fancy. Uh, so as a result of those uh, those um, discussions, we came up with like first uh, first sketch of the proxy. It's uh, dated to September last year, but it supports search for tables, dashboards, uh, four kinds of databases uh, at least. Uh, relationships between tables and uh, dashboards. Actually, it was um, uh, it was fully functional at the time uh, we had deployed it to cloud. Um, and basically, the idea is uh, that it could be a better offering than original user interface of uh, GCP due to the um, better user experience. It's uh, it just uh, looks better, and it's. Uh, like more opinionated way uh, to present information, the data catalog use, user interface is pretty rough. Uh, and do, as our um, discovery went on, we also realized that uh, Google has some concept of uh, synchronizing data between different systems to, to data catalog. So you have out of the box connectors to around 15 uh, systems 13 of them are uh, database system, two of them are uh, dashboard systems. These are like Python libraries. You can just run and sync your data from Hive, Metastore, or Atlas, or MySQL, uh, or Tableau directly to data catalogs. So you could reuse them to enrich your data catalog and then uh, run Amundsen on top of it to, um, to, uh, to display your metadata from data catalog. So that's just a very rough idea and a very brief summary of the RFC. If anyone has any comments or questions, I'm open to ask them. I surfaced it also because I got I got a question from our colleagues from a different company. And I think that for a brief moment, Truecaller had also an idea to use this as a uh, Amundsen with the GCP, uh, but went different routes. So that somehow uh, re, uh, rebooted this idea. That's why the RFC appeared. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions or comments from Marius? I'll ask you one, Marius. In this in this uh, proposal, would you be using yes. the GCP proxy in addition to uh, the Neo4j proxy, or is this is all G GCP proxy with no additional uh, metadata service or proxy running behind? So it basically assumes uh, that you would replace uh, Neo4j or Atlas and uh, Elasticsearch proxies with um, GCP data catalog. It provides a REST API to and uh, to actually fulfill a majority of the um, majority of the functionalities. And provided by search and metadata proxy. So you have a search in, uh, in GCP data catalog API, and it, it's just transparent to, to the end user how it, how it decides on uh, order of results it uh, returns. Just say that it's measured by somehow relevance, but it's like a very transparent and uh, opaque to, to us. How does it happen? But actually, uh, how we implemented is that we um, used GCP search 
proxy and GCP data catalog amount, so, uh, metadata proxy. So there were no like uh, any managed services or half managed uh, use, just, uh, just, uh, or sorry, I saw it wrong. So there were no like additional services deployed. You didn't have to uh, install any database or uh, book any additional service. You just use data catalog, which is uh, anyway provided by uh, by uh, Google Cloud when you set up an account. Cool. All so right. do you need to, uh, questions, do you need to do the same like uh, what you did for the Atlas, like have some entity type of translation between GCP in, uh, into, into Amazon? Yeah, so that's a good question. So actually, as for the dashboard and table entities, you don't have to really do uh, anything new because there is a concept of dashboard and uh, and table saved into the connectors I was talking about. So all of these those connectors already register um, register appropriate entity types which uh, which are similarly aligned which are mostly aligned to, for example, what Atlas provides. So you have a like a super type of table and then there are multiple data, different database systems that um, inherit from, it, from this type. So for the basic functionalities, you don't need to uh, register any custom entities. It's where you come out, where you uh, want to de deploy functionalities like uh, frequent users or data owners, that's where you would need to register your uh, new types of entities. Cool, thank you. We have one minute left. Uh, I was hoping to open the floor, but in, in the spirit of time, I'm not gonna do that. If y'all have any questions or comments or things that you would like to see in the next community meeting, please, uh, I'll start a thread right after this on the community channel and we can uh, we can chat more there. I'll also post a recording shortly after. Um, and uh, I'm at this point, I'm gonna thank you all for attending. Appreciate your time today. And thank you to the speakers today, Jacob, Tao, Allison, and Marius. And we hope to see you next month. If I can, 30 seconds, please. just to thank Mark uh, Allison, Tao, and just everyone who's a part of this community for helping to cultivate this community. It's always encouraging to come to these meetings and hear the future of the project and everything. So thank you. Thank you for all the work that you put into this. Thank you for joining. Thanks for being part of the community. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. 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 Take care.